baggage in the Dharma by eschewing lying, uh, striving ever towards the truth, not evading or avoiding truth, eschewing authorities and discovering the truth for oneself. And this is uh, emphasized in the Pali Canon by the Buddha that the, uh, each individual is responsible for find, discovering the truth for himself or herself, primarily by the study of Dharma books and listening to Dharma teachers and independent reading and reflection, but also by a personal commitment to view reality objectively, rationally, and scientifically in the tr proper sense of the word, and without attachment. All of this is implied in the second jewel. The third jewel is taking refuge in the Sangha. The Sangha is formally a c the community of monks, but it is also the community of all beings, the community of all Buddhists, and the community of all superior beings, including the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Arhants, and perhaps some god beings who have converted to Buddhism. We take refuge in each of these in different ways, primarily by following the precepts, but the ultimate refuge can only be taken in the community of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Arhants. Uh, obviously, it doesn't make sense to take refuge in a novice monastic or a Puttajana monastic, for example. All of this is implied in the third jewel. From the foregoing, we conclude that the following represent the highest vibration of the three jewels. I take my refuge in the universal and innate Buddha sentience that is the fundamental reality of mind. I take my refuge in the power of the truth of the primeval way. I take my refuge in the community of ultimately enlightened beings. He who takes refuge is a refugee. A refugee is always in a state of flight, escaping from the evil that threatens him. The evil that threatens the Buddhist refugee is desirous attachment, the evil itself being karmic bondage and rebirth. Existence can never be redeemed. However deep one looks into existence, one finds ever self-proliferating violence, chaos, conflict, and suffering. There is no world, the Buddha says, in which the preconditions of suffering are not fundamental. For what world is devoid of change? This flux or continuous change frustrates attachment and creates suffering. On the other hand, attachment creates these worlds for, the, for where there is perfect detachment. There is no desire for rebirth, therefore rebirth itself ends once all existing karma is expiated. In this way, existence is an illusion or a delusion. Existence is created by the mind and can be destroyed by the mind. This is the answer to the question why we cannot create a perfect society of perfectly enlightened beings and so redeem existence. If this were possible, it cannot be on the plane of change. Still, human beings continue to labor and to build. The scriptures teach that we humans are in a unique situation to appreciate dharma, We're neither too distressed nor too blessed to be too involved in other positive or negative actions, respectively, with no time or intention to develop the thirst for transcendence. However, human beings themselves have large groups that are either too poor or too rich to appreciate dharma, paralleling the greater condition of of higher and lower beings. When Sangha and society are the same, such a society can be said to be relatively dharmic, that is, as enlightened as possible within the human state. Shambhala is a city like this, and like Shambhala, such a society will spontaneously produce many enlightened beings, as well as spiritual culture and a proliferation of the high arts and the best qualities in people generally. Creating such a society may be the next step in human evolution as the present stage draws close to its conclusion. Ironically, Buddhism, with its long history of poverty, may well become the true religion of technocracy, as prophesied in the Kala Chakra. Some people long for the end of samsara, whereas others who criticize Buddhism... Oh, I see a question. Paloma Porta says, isn't mind translated differently here? For the West, the mind is emotions and thinking perhaps, but mind here includes the Buddha nature, yes. Hence all exists in the mind. Yes, the, word, the English word mind actually covers a, a real a gamut of uh, meanings 
which in the Pali are distinguished by a, a much more refined vocabulary. So we do really do have to be aware of this when we use the word mind. In different, we really have to interpret it in different contexts. In some contexts, mind refers to pure contentless sentience in and of itself, which is coterminous with reality itself, or perhaps the mind stream, the sanctana. And another level, it's the five aggregates, the, the, the psyche uh, or the ego. So uh, we, we do have to be aware when we're using the word mind of the context in which it is used in order to understand the uh, statement. Some people long for the end of samsara, whereas others who criticize Buddhism say that Buddhism is nihilism because once all beings are enlightened, existence will cease. And some of the religious, uh, the secondary religious texts, I haven't actually found this in the canon so far, but some of the religious texts do imply this. However, where the scriptures refer to the end of samsara, they are referring to the end of desirous attachment and rebirth. For samsara is beginningless and therefore must be endless as well. Samsara is none other than the principle of temporal differentiation itself, the originating principle that is one polarity of the whole and therefore essential. Samsara is therefore beginningless in time and infinitely differentiated. Since the ultimate principle of differentiation is the karmic agency itself, there are an infinity of beings caught in an endless cycle of transmigration. Illusory may be, but experienced for all that. Okay, that completes the first mini talk on refuge. Next, we're going to discuss the Four Noble Truths. The only thing more fundamental to formal Buddhist belief than the Four Noble Truths is taking refuge in the Three Jewels. All Buddhists accept the Four Noble Truths. How more, however, what do the Four Noble Truths mean? We can address this using the method of questioning. The popular formulation of the Four Noble Truths goes something like, life is suffering, suffering is caused by desire, the end of desire is the end of suffering, the way to end desire is the Noble Eightfold Path. I'm going to restate them slightly as follows in more, somewhat more exacting language to clarify what we are really talking about. The nature of rebirth is to suffer. The root cause of suffering is the attachment of desire, or sometimes I use the term desirous attachment. Through the extinction of the of desirous attachment or the attachment of desire, suffering ceases. The way to extinguish the attachment of desire is to follow the Noble Eightfold Fold Path in accordance with the middle way between all extremes. The eight steps are an elaboration of the perfections of body, word, deed, and livelihood, heart, effort, mindfulness, and meditation, and mind, understanding, and intention. Much is made of the psychological implications of the Buddha's teachings and his apparent reticence with respect to questions concerning metaphysics. Nevertheless, a metaphysical construct underlies and implies them, as they too are implicit in reality. Therefore, the question arises, what is the reality implied by the Four Noble Truths? <coughs> Alternatively, what is their essential nature? Rebirth is the fundamental characteristic of samsara, the differentiated phenomenology that human beings as sentient subjects experience in and through the body as lived reality, governed by karma, the law of cause and effect on all levels, mental, verbal, and physical. It is rebirth, driven by karma and characterized by suffering, that is the fundamental problem of the Buddha. The Buddha does not accept any mode of existence that implies change or flux as a solution to this problem since desire posits stasis and all lived realities are impermanent and transitory by nature. This is the very definition of samsara. Therefore, the Buddha posits transcendence as an absolute goal that necessarily implies the cessation of lived reality. This may or may not imply the cessation of the ontological substrate itself, since there are indefinite numbers of suffering beings besides oneself. Salvation only applies to the individual who achieves the goal of absolute transcendence on his or her own, 
something of a challenging concept to those extremists who wish to take the concept of no self or anatta to an extreme and deny the existence of, uh, of any sort of a self. The salvation of one does not imply the salvation of all. Therefore, to end samsara itself, I see a question. Bombadali, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, desire causes stasis, seems the opposite. Desire, desire, desire's attachment is the desire for the transitory phenomenon, the process phenomenon, to be, to be uh, static, uh, be because it gives us happiness, it gives us joy, pleasure, and happiness. So we don't want it to change. We want to keep, to hold it, to grasp it. The Buddha uses the term grasping to grasp it and hold it in stasis. So desirous attachment is the will, if you like, to hold things in stasis, and of course. The essential nature of reality is, is that it is transitory, it is a process, the process nature of reality, and therefore uh, it cannot be achieved. And um, because it cannot be achieve, achieved, it, uh, it uh, causes us suffering. Bambadali says, what about desire for an improvement? Any kind of improvement implies a goal which again is static say I want to improve my house I want to make my house look better so I go to all sorts of effort in or and spend all sorts of money in order to make my house look exactly the way I want it to be is it going to stay like that forever no it's going to ch it's going to change it's going to deteriorate and as a consequence of that deterioration it causes me unhappiness. So I have to redouble my efforts in order to keep it the way I want it to be so I become sucked into the, to the process and constantly fighting this transitoriness which ultimately causes suffering. I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. Um, seem to have lost track. My my chat closed, so I'm look. I've opened it, and I'm looking for the improvement word to see where we started from. And I seem to have lost track of it. So anyway, let me look for question marks from the end. I see comments. I don't see questions. So I'm going to carry on. I don't see any questions, all I see are comments. Um, so where was I? Uh, infinite numbers of suffering beings beside oneself. Was that it? Yes. Salvation only applies to the individual who achieves the goal of absolute transcendence on his or her own. The salvation of one does not imply the salvation of all. Therefore, to end samsara itself, one would have to con continue it, to, to contrive it rather, so that everyone in a single human generation achieves transcendence altogether. Uh, although possible in theory, given what we know now about the extent of the universe, it does not seem even remotely plausible. Therefore, we take the view that samsara, understood metaphysically or ontologically, is eternal and infinitely differentiated. A paradox, eternal yet uh, yet transitory, rather than finite and limited. There are other good arguments for this view as well, especially all of the same problems that are associated with theism, including theism itself. This in turn leads us further to the ultimate view that samsara is actually the natural antipode of nirvana and that reality itself must be transdual. This view is also called the clear light. This leads to the realization that samsara and nirvana are one, and further to the realization that pain and suffering themselves are illusions swallowed up in the natural perfection that must be the true ground. Nevertheless, the experience of suffering exists, even if only as the illusion of an omniscient and perfect Buddha nature, 
That is, and when I say it exists, I mean that it is, obviously, it is experienced. And so even if it is illusory, in that sense it, does, it exists. And this is the transdual view. Again, we, the, the samsara is both exists and does not exist. We're constantly in the when we have when we are working from the transdual view, we are constantly involved in uh, really infinite paradoxes. The infinity of samsara implies an infinity of individually differentiated mind streams or santanas. This also corresponds to what we experience in the world. And actually, there's a wonderful little book uh, which really explains this very clearly and succinctly by the Dalai Lama called The Buddha Nature, and I do recommend it. I see a question from Rolo. Is the illusory aspect of pain and suffering only the emotional experience while physical suffering, uh, feeling pain is real? Um, the Buddha actually talks about this. He uh, talks about it in his simile of the two darts. Uh, even a Buddha experiences physical pain. Uh, th the Buddha, our Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, complains of experiencing pain uh, towards the end of his life. But the difference between an enlightened being and a non-enlightened being is that while the non-enlightened being is attached to his pain and therefore suffers, uh, psychologically suffers, I like the word angst actually as a translation of dukkha rather than suffering, um, the uh, enlightened being also experiences the physical sensation of pain, but he is not attached to that pain, and therefore he does not suffer. That is to say, he is not attached to it. He does not suffer within himself. Uh, he's not concerned about that pain. And this can ultimately, of course, be taken very far. Uh, as um, Robert Thurman has pointed out, if you think your guru is, is truly enlightened, uh, ask him to hold, to hold his breath indefinitely. A true Buddha would be, will, would be willing to hold his breath till his death because it's meaningless to him. His own death is meaningless to him. However, there are very few gurus around who are capable of that degree of detachment. Self-immolation actually is prized. I personally don't agree with it, but in some schools of uh, Buddhism, uh, self-immolation is prized as a uh, demonstration of this degree of detachment. In fact, Aushaka, king, the great uh, world monarch uh, and first Buddhist king, King Aushaka, Ashaka, Ashaka, pardon me, in the third century BC, sent emissaries uh, to different countries to uh, propagate the Dharma. And one of these emissaries, I believe it was Rome, it was either the one who went to the Greeks or it was one who went to Rome. And I'm not absolutely certain which one it was, but he. Uh, he uh, immolated himself in order to demonstrate his, his faith to the uh, barbarians. So, this also corresponds to what we experience in the world. These mind streams are not atas, the Sanskrit word is atmans, because their continuity is temporal, not spatial. They are the fundamental reality of samsara, and their interaction creates perception that in turn creates lived reality, characterized by desire, suffering, and ignorance. However, as we have shown desire and suffering to be illusions, so too is ignorance an illusion of the underlying Buddha nature that is the subtle essence of the mind streams themselves. So ultimately, to answer your question from another level, suffering itself is also an illusion. However, within our contingent reality, of course, it is not an illusion. The mind streams themselves are essentially information, that is, karmic propensities or tendencies. Thus, lived reality itself is information. Matter is a delusion of the senses. And actually, science is increasingly coming to this view. Uh, there is now a theory of, of science called uh, digital physics, in wh which, which recognizes that all the scientific laws are reducible to uh, digital formulae, and materiality is, is, is meaningless in that context. It's the next step beyond the Einstein's matter equals energy. The next step is energy equals information. And this has led to theories like virtuality, for example, or the notion that we are uh, living in a, a two-dimensional uh, two hologram 
on the, uh, at the uh, event horizon of a black hole, as another example. The Buddha never states that transcendence implies cessation in the ontological sense. In fact, he continuously implies that the individual who achieves transcendence is immortal. What is rejected is not even samsara, which, as I have shown, is ontologically essential and therefore indestructible, but illusory attachments that create the illusion of suffering, concealing the fundamental Buddha nature from its own realization, or from the realization of its own fundamental nature. The cessation implied by nirvana is the cessation of an illusion resulting from the delusion that lived reality presents a complete and self-sufficient explanation of existence, especially the belief in the self that underlies the illusions of permanence, satisfactoriness, attachment, etc. The attachment to desire is therefore ultimately extinguished by the realization that there are no selves, no permanent things that can be possessed and held in stasis forever, and that therefore to desire these things in a fixed way or with attachment inherently causes pain. That this view has in social and political implications is apparent, since the society in which we exist uh, the, 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 is, is, is single-mindedly devoted uh, to desirous attachment. Theoretically, one can enjoy existence from moment to moment without attachment, as a Buddha does, but such a solution is short-lived, for the price of the enjoyment of existence is the end of rebirth. If I were not attached, then why would I create the karma of rebirth? It is a catch-22. This karma itself is created by desirous attachment. This is why vitalistic mysticism or mystical hedonism, so-called, of the type associated with Aleister Crowley, for example, uh, and if you uh, want to learn something about this, you can read J.F.C. Fuller's work, The Star in the West, is self-contradictory and often self-destructive. One can only enjoy the world when and to the extent that one renounces it. Only the real renunciate dare practice Tantra, the rarest jewel of all. Uh, the world only gives herself up to those who do not desire her, as I wrote uh, in one of my book of poems, Katas. Since desirous attachment is caused, that is, by ignorance, it is not essential and can be extinguished through karmic means on the levels of body, heart, and mind in accordance with the middle way between extremes. The middle way has two aspects. Horizontally, it is the energy of peace, balance, and equilibrium. Vertically, it is the power of truth achieved by the pursuit of the transdual. Okay, uh, Cherry Bichette, thank you very much. The perfection of the body implies control of speech, action, and livelihood, both negative, that is self-restraint, and positive, that is good speech, good deeds, and good livelihood. The latter is for the bodhisattva, who seeks rebirth in the service of the future. The arhat, who seeks to transcend rebirth as soon as possible and for himself alone, avoids good speech, action, and livelihood, rather like the Jain ascetic, in order to avoid creating merit that may lead to rebirth. I've written elsewhere on the perfections of the body and how too literal understanding here is self-contradictory. The Buddha himself refers to these perfections as elementary and inferior, which is not to say that they are not necessary. The core perfections here are not killing, not stealing, no wrongful sex, uh, no lying, and about eight years into his career he also uh, added uh, no drinking, or which may, we may interpret as no drunkenness. The perfection of the heart includes effort, mindfulness, and meditation. The perfection of effort implies enthusiasm or energy, something virya, which is something the Buddha emphasizes. The perfection of mindfulness implies the realization of the essential emptiness of awareness. The perfection of meditation implies mental control. Finally, the perfection of mind includes understanding and intention. Understanding implies the complete and perfect comprehension of dharma as the fundamental law of life. He who has right view knows through questioning that the dharma is true. He knows. Intention implies the will to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings, the ultimate altruistic aspiration. The perfection of the body is the perfection of action. 
the perfection of the heart is the perfection of energy. The perfection of the mind is the perfection of reason. That concludes the second mini-talk. We're going to go on now to discuss the Noble Eightfold uh, Path. I think I typed that in. That's strange. There we go. The Noble Eightfold Path, Aryo Atangiko Maga, is the conventional English translation of the Fourth Noble Truth, the Arya Sachang, Sachan, Sachani, rather, the Arya Sachani of the Buddha, which exposes the spiritual praxis by which the Third Noble Truth, that is, the cessation of existential suffering, uh, dukkha, or angst, as I've called it, articulated in the first three noble truths is realized. The Noble Eightfold Path consists of eight limbs. Uh, the Pali word is Anga and is conventionally tra translated as right view, samaditi, right intention, sama sankapa, right speech, sama vacha, right action, sama kamanta, right livelihood, sama ajiva, right effort, sama vayama, right mindfulness, samasati, and right concentration, sama samadhi. Later in his career, the Buddha uh, reformulated the Noble Eightfold Path in terms of three primary attainments, wisdom, or panya, morality, sila, and meditation, or samadhi. And I should clarify that statement a little bit. Um, it, what, he accepted this reformulation, if you like, of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's called the threefold classification, or the, uh, or the three higher trainings uh, sometimes. Uh, the, it was actually originated by a nun, interestingly, in view of the uh, somewhat misogynistic tendencies of certain citizens in the Pali Canon. Um, her name was Damadina, and it was she who actually proposed this reclassification, if you like, of the Noble Eightfold Path. But the Bull Buddha fully accepted uh, it and, and used it in his teaching. So, Dr. Peter Macefield has severely criticized the conventional translation of Arya as noble. But in fact, almost every word of the conventional English translation is inadequate and misleading, both intrinsically and in terms of their connotations in English. The conventional English translations are too general and too vague to express what the eight critical constituents of the Buddhist praxis are in fact. In particular, the translations do not express the sequential nature of the path, a point made emphatically by Dr. Macefield in his PhD thesis and subsequent publication, Divine Revelation in the Pali Canon. Thus, the impression that is left on the English reader is that this is a set of injunctions, not unlike the injunctions of ethical and belief-based religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, rather than a yoga. This vagueness has been taken up by religious Buddhists, both Western and Asian, so that the Noble Eightfold Path uh, has become little more than a belief system and an ethical system culminating in a vague notion of meditation, which in popular thinking connotes little more than relaxation therapy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Consequently, many Westerners practice meditation based on little more than an intellectual assent to a system of doctrines and the following of basic ethical rules, uh, as, such as not killing, not stealing, chastity, not lying and not drinking, or, or taking drugs. And incidentally, the Buddha never said anything about drugs. Anywhere you read the precepts where it says uh, that the, the precept against drinking includes drugs is a mistranslation, and I confirmed this in uh, the Pali Canon by looking at the Pali words, and I've discussed it in other talks in detail. As I've shown elsewhere, the Buddha himself disparaged both religion, Brahmanism, and ordinary ethics, which he designated as elementary matters of mere morality, quote-unquote. This way of thinking is based on a misunderstanding of the word sama, which does not mean right or even righteous, but rather connotes completeness and even perfection. Similarly, the word Arya does not primarily mean noble, with its English racialist and classist connotations, but rather high, ideal, pure, perfect, and sublime, qualities that are attainable by all races and classes. 
Even these words do not properly connote the meaning of the word Aryan, which refers specifically to the ancient Indian Vedic way of the rishis that the Buddha brought, sought to restore to its primordial purity. Thus, it also connotes spiritual as distinct from religious in the bad or superficial sense, that is, a system of mere observances, except the connotation of the English word spiritual is too weak, exalted is better. The following translation is my attempt to find an English version of the Noble Eightfold Path based on these and additional considerations, based on a profound re-examination of the literal and etymological meaning of the Pali, for which I have relied heavily on the Pali English Dictionary of the Pali Text Society, rooted in the primary understanding of the path as a system of yoga based on a universalist understanding of spiritual aspiration and experience. So I will paste that retranslation, if you like, into the chat. And then I'll simply uh, summarize it. So, um, We have, first of all, the fourth sublime fact, which is my uh, term for the fourth noble truth. The no, then the sublime eightfold eight-part method, um, which is uh, my uh, version of noble eightfold path. And then we have it divided into, first of all, the three, uh, the three parts corresponding to the threefold classification of the Nandamadina. Gnosis, or wisdom, self-discipline, and mental concentration. Under gnosis, or wisdom, we have perfect understanding and perfect intention. Under self-discipline, we have perfect speaking, perfect acting, and perfect living. And finally, under mental concentration, we have perfect striving, perfect realization, and perfect transcendence. When one looks at the sublime eight-part method in this way, the structure of the way as a reflection of the anatomy of the person becomes self-evident. Thus, the first two parts correspond to the faculty of thinking. The following three parts correspond to speaking and action, thus completing the triad of thought, word, and deed. The concluding supermundane parts correspond to will, consciousness, and transcendent or transdual consciousness, respectively. And I see a question from Paloma Porta. But everything is perfect. What does this mean? There are no ethics, you said. Um, well, you've, you've asked me two things there. So first of all, I'll address the first part. Uh, everything is perfect, but only from the per perception of a Buddha. Since we're not Buddhas, we work within the reality of our own uh, situation, which uh, since we have not realized the Buddha nature, uh, everything is not perfect and therefore we have to work to achieve Buddha nature. So in a, in a certain technical sense, what you say is correct, but as soon as, y as, well, I won't say you as an unenlightened being, because I don't know whether you are an enlightened being or not, but as soon as one says, as an unenlightened being, that everything is perfect, one has immediately entered into delusion. So that is, from our perspective, from a sangsaric perspective, to say that, is a false and deluded statement. And uh, it leads, therefore, to false and deluded uh, cons consequences or implications. Now, with respect to your second part, there are no ethics. Uh, no, I didn't say there are no ethics. I would suggest you uh, 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 read my talk in the first Siddha of the Digha Nikaya, or simply read the first Siddha of the Digha Nikaya yourself. It's a very important Siddha. It was chosen to be placed first in the Siddha Pitaka, so it must be very significant. And in that uh, sutta, the Buddha uh, derogates uh, at great length the whole concept of uh, ethics and ethical salvation. This does not imply that ethics are, that there are no ethics or that ethics are not necessary, but uh, they are, uh, he calls them uh, trivial matters that would only uh, impress the ignorant. That's what, that's what he says about ethics. Uh, Paloma Porta says, what would be wrong speaking, for example, to be wrong is just a judgment. Wrong, it is a judgment. It's a judgment made within samsara, and wrong speaking would be speaking that causes harm. 
quite simply. And therefore leads to negative karmic consequences. To continue, when one looks at the sublime eight-part method in this way, the structure of the way is a reflection of the anatomy of the person becomes self-evident. Thus, the first two parts correspond to the faculty of thinking. The following three parts correspond to thinking and action, thus completing the triad of thought, word, and deed. The concluding supermundane parts correspond to will consciousness and transcendent or transdual consciousness, respectfully, respectively. Students of anatta, the doctrine of no self, may also be disconcerted to discover that sati also means self-possession, self-consciousness, that is, the sentience of sentience in itself as distinct from the sentience of phenomena. This is, of course, the word that's customarily translated as mindfulness. It also means remembrance or recollection. The most disconcerting element of this, this exegesis, which also forms a critical aspect of Dr. Macefield's analysis, is that the first part of this method does not e refers merely to intellectual or philosophical belief, but rather to the perfection of the salvific knowledge of Dharma, a detail that is almost entirely neglected in the West, and thus, according to this interpretation, vitiating or at best diminishing the nearly exclusive Western emphasis on meditation. There's really, uh, right now in the West, uh, uh, there's a cult of meditation. And if you actually read the Pali Canon in its entirety, because this is a, a really a, an observation which grows on one as one reads all of the suttas, as, as I have done uh, once through, I'm intending to read them through five times, um, the meditation is not that important. What is important in the Pali Canon and what is the essential salvific principle is not meditation, and I'm not saying meditation isn't important, I'm just saying it's not the most important thing. The most important thing and the essential or primary salvific principle in uh, is uh, wisdom and the cultivation of wisdom. And this is something I emphasize, therefore, because it's something that I've, I've, re come to, I've realized through my study of the Pali Canon, that it's meditation in conjunction with the cultivation of wisdom that is the cell that that create that is cell, the, the salvific process and it is wisdom uh, which is of course the cure of ignorance which if you're familiar with the 12 the chain the 12 fold chain of causation or dependent origination uh, um, ignorance is the primary principle so meditation is certainly important and I'm not certainly saying that it, it, one shouldn't meditate or that it's not important but one should not neglect the cultivation of wisdom, that is really the essential thing uh, about uh, the Buddhist path. The anti-intellectual prejudice is so ingrained in certain circles of Western Buddhism that anyone who actually thinks about the teachings is disparaged as a mere academic or an intellectual. Some Buddhist groups regard questioners as potential troublemakers. This merely mirrors the modern Western prejudice against philosophical speculation and the widespread ignorance that characterizes North American society in particular. On the other hand, certain religionists would also have it that ethics or mor morality constitute the basis of the method, followed by meditation, with wisdom as the culmination of the path. This interpretation is precisely opposite to the exposition of the Buddha himself. Okay, that concludes the third mini-talk. And we'll conclude with the fourth mini-talk called The Arrows of the Path. Let me just have a little bit of my water. I'm on day seven of, my, uh, of a 10-day water fast, so I'm a bit dry. Soon after one begins to study religion phenomenologically uh, as the exploration of actual experiences, one discovers that experiential spirituality includes both active and passive approaches. This talk is actually less about Dharma specifically than uh, about uh, the science of spirituality in general, although it certainly applies uh, to, uh, to Dharma. 
I think I see a question, even though there's no question mark. Bum, uh, Bum Badali says, okay, I'll cut off your arm off. There is no harm. Sounds highly logical to me. I'm not sure what you're referring to in my talk that would cause you to draw that implication. I certainly uh, didn't mean to imply that if that's what, if, if in fact you're basing it, that statement on something that I said. Uh, so perhaps you could find the statement I made that uh, you're asking me about because I can't really reply to that because I have no idea how it relates to what I said. I see. Okay. So nothing to do with my talk, therefore. Okay, let's continue then. Um, so, soon after one begins to study religion phenomenologically as the exploration of actual experiences, one discovers that experiential spirituality includes both active and passive approaches. The passive approach studies those experiences that occur to others and indirectly through whatever monuments they bequeath to us, their successors. This is the orthodox approach that has become the religious establishment of the New World Order, the organization of the great religious monuments of, of humankind. Okay, I see a question from Dar. I assume this question is directed to me. But from my understanding, meditation leads to wisdom. From my understanding, no, that's entirely incorrect. Meditation does not lead to wisdom. That is a misinterpretation of Dhamma Dinah's formula. And I have explained that in another talk. Um, it would really take me too long to explain all the ins and outs of this point here. Um, I just complete, I'll finish reading your question though. Uh, meditation leads to wisdom from my understanding, which wisdom, mean, which wisdom means experiential knowledge of seeing things as they really are. So meditation is actually very important. Meditation is very important, and I'm certainly not neglecting the importance of meditation. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying med wisdom is the foundation followed by um, followed by uh, uh, ethics and and meditation, but it is not the, it is not something that arises spontaneously out of a process which is found based on ethics as a foundation, and then meditation as the second point, and then med the meditation the third point arises out of that. It's precisely the opposite, and if you look at the sequence of the Noble Eightfold Path, it begins with wisdom, followed by morality followed by meditation, and each step in the path is a distinct entity. No, no step in, this path, in the path arises spontaneously as a result of the former, but there is, a there is a illogical sequence to it. The Noble Eightfold Path gives the sequence. The formulation of Dhammadina gives the priority. So if you look at the order in which Dhammadina has presented the items, she's going from least to, to, high, to highest importance, but each step is a discrete entity, and the sequence is shown by the Noble Eightfold Path. And if you're interested in discussing that, uh, I can try and find a talk in which I discuss this at some length. Uh, I did, there is a talk uh, that I did in which I discuss this at, at some length, because this was actually, when I was re doing my series of talks on the Digga Nikaya, this was something that was of interest to me, and I actually found, finally, by the end of the series of talks, I did find the answer, which I just summarized to you in a very succinct form. But if you really want to go into it in more detail and discuss it afterwards at uh, Dharma by the Tracks, I'd be happy to do so, and even try and find the talk in which I discuss this. Yes, okay, I'll try and find it. It was one of the more recent ones. I might be able to find it by using the search in my uh, blog. It's a very interesting question uh, because they're inconsistent. And I recognized right from the beginning when I was giving the series of talks the inconsistency. And I, want, and I wanted to figure out what the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of it was. And I finally was able to bring them into alignment with each other. And I also found scholarly uh, basis for, uh, in the research for, for it as well. So it isn't just my opinion either. But uh, we can discuss this uh, at length afterwards if you're interested in the, at Dharma, uh, Dharma uh, by the tracks. So, where was I? Um, 
Sorry, I've lost track of where I was. Anyone remember what I was just talking about? Okay, this is the orthodox approach that has become the religious establishment of the New World Order, the organization of the great religious monuments of humankind. Their names are familiar to us. The Bible and the Quran are the two great Western examples. In Asia, the Vedas, the Pali Canon, and the Tibetan and Chinese canons, including the Taoist canon, fall into this category, along with many others in both the West and Asia. These traditions have been codified through long discussion over centuries and are all deeply influenced by the feudal period of history. For most of them, feudalism came after, uh, came later rather than the period of their inception and is now in its senescence, especially the belief in authority, the tendency to fundamentalism and a hierarchical collectivist totalitarianism that would not be tolerated in ordinary society today. And a notable exception to the foregoing generalization is Islam, of course, which still clings to this, this, this feudal mentality. I would personally would associate this with the uh, midpoint of the 5,000-year Buddhist cycle, the 2,500-year cycle, which is cu culminating uh, in this uh, century. The active approach to the phenomenological exploration, and I, by saying that either I don't mean to disparage Islamic mysticism at all. Uh, there is a very powerful and, and, and valuable spirituality within Islam. Unfortunately, however, mainstream Islam pretty much rejects it. I have yet to meet a Muslim who, for example, considers Sufis, Sufism to be uh, Islamic. The active approach to the phenomenological exploration of spiritual experience entails the deliberate induction of experiences that may be described as spiritual, religious, or mystical. Experiences of this type are not merely experienced, they are also sought and have been for tens of thousands of years. It is certainly true that the religious monuments referred to above are amongst the greatest works of human genius and true wonders of the world, if by greatness we mean beauty, sublimity, profundity, humanity, depth, splendor, grandeur, and ultimate righteousness, as well as the capacity to induce, induce these qualities in others. Unfortunately, all of this is all under attack today by fascio capitalism, but that's another, that's another discussion. The traditions associated with these icons receive the utmost veneration of billions of humans and have since very early in their inception. All tend to various degrees of mutual animosity and hostility. Orthodoxy, as noticed above, tends, uh, as noted above rather, tends to preserve traditional modes of thought and moral and ethical systems that affect the societies with which they coexist. However, the growing power of science, technology, and industry has led to a new world order, a secular society that tolerates tradition because of its stability, but is fundamentally hostile to it. Both orthodoxy and the new world order are inherently interested in their own beliefs, values, and systems of organization, and all therefore, and are, all, therefore are collectivist and conformist in principle. Active experiential spirituality, on the other hand, is inherently individual, experimental, challenging, and even dysfunctional, a common characteristic of all creative states. Thus, orthodoxy and the New World Order both dislike it. Yet the authentic phenomenological exploration of experience leads inevitably to it, for no one can truly understand what one has not experienced, and the direct experience of being demands the daring to demand a personal and direct relationship with it. Without this direct and personal relationship to being, there is no authenticity and no truth. In the words of Heidegger, science does not think. This judgment stands inscribed above all of the portals of academe today, which collaborates with the New World Order in the service of tradition whilst bantering or bickering over footnotes. All of the following is crystallized around the whole social hysteria and authoritarian collectivist conformism surrounding the legal status of LSD and other psychedelics, the ultimate arrows of the path. It is only when we imagine a world that is truly free that we realize just how truly unfree we are as we enter the era of scientific totalitarianism foretold by Huxley. Huxley also supported the hypothesis, subsequently developed by Terence McKenna, 
of the origin of the rapid evolution of the human neocortex uh, in the ingestion of hallucinogenic mushrooms by early primates. Any discussion of active spiritual phenomenology, therefore, carries with it an aura of danger and risk. And I should also point out that Terence McKenna said that uh, Mahayana Buddhism is closer to the psychedelic experience than any other form of spirituality of which he was aware, except perhaps shamanism. But he doesn't. He actually mentions Mahayana Buddhism. When one studies spiritual and religious experience in this way, one begins to recognize the recurrence of methods and techniques that parallel Jung's doctrine of the archetypes, which, either alone or in combination with psychedelics, have the capacity to induce authentic and transformative personal, spiritual, and religious crises in suitably prepared individuals in appropriate and supportive settings. These methods and techniques are complex, incorporating many different elements conditioned by psychology, symbology, metaphysics, historical tradition, time, culture, place, etc. However, when one analyzes these, one does not find increasing complexity. Instead, one discovers a finite set of active methods and techniques that in turn correspond to the methods and techniques used by archaic peoples whose origins in prehistory presumably reflect universal dynamics that underlie the historical traditions that survive today, including, of course, Buddhism. These methods and techniques appear to operate in conjunction with inherent characteristics of human psychology to induce altered states of consciousness, including alterations in physical sensing, emoting, thinking, and changes in energy and behavior. Although difficult and dysfunctional changes do occur, the overwhelming preponderance of judgment of those who have actually had these experiences, including highly educated and trained observers, is that they are positive, blissful, truthful, energizing, and ennobling experiences, and that they lead to real, long-lasting, and beneficial psychological changes and social behaviors. Similarly, Mircea Eliade found that the shamans were the psychologically healthiest and most integrated members of society. The religious monuments of tradition originate and produce experiences of just this type, much of their art, literature, and oral traditions originating in just this type of experience. The scientific totalitarianism of the New World Order, however, places a negative construction upon these experiences as well as tradition itself, the influence of which is being progressively eroded by the influence of the former including judgments that these experiences are bizarre, dysfunctional, delusional, disorienting, false, and individually socially dangerous aberrations. Communism is the logical resultant of radical secularism and in which religion is actively persecuted and criminalized. Today we see the convergence of communism and capitalism as capitalism itself becomes increasingly scientistic, materialistic, totalitarian, and authoritarian. Under the current dominant system of scientific totalitarianism and global corporatism, spiritual experience is medicalized <coughs> and suppressed with drug treatment programs, if necessary, to, reduce, to induce a return to consensual conformity. It is barely tolerated in the form of the creative fringe. Okay, that concludes my talk for... Uh, Today, before we uh, proceed to the dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit of this talk to all beings, does anyone have any questions, comments, or discussion? And while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to quickly get a good glass of water, and then I'll be back, and if there are no questions in the chat, we'll proceed with the dedication of merit. Okay, that didn't take too long. Let me see if there's anything there. Um, Bambadali Bamba asks um, the question I asked you that you missed is that the judgment of harm implies ethics, does it not? I didn't say that ethics had no importance. What I said is that ethics are, tri are trivial and unimportant in relationship to the, uh, to the path or to, and to the attainment of a Tathagata. 
the Buddha does list not killing, for example, in his list of uh, precepts, which are, uh, he uses such words as trivial, minor, insignificant. Uh, this does not imply that there are no ethics, but that this implies that ethics are merely, are, are mere guidelines, merely the foundation for uh, a process, if you like, the path, which is of far greater significance. That's, that's what I said. I certainly was not implying that there are no ethics. If you wish to uh, study this in the Buddhist, the primary Buddhist literature itself, like, as I said, I suggest you read the first Sutta of the Digha Nikaya, which is also the first Sutta of the Sutta Pitaka, uh, and, there, and was chosen, obviously, to be the first Sutta. It, I don't have it handy. It's called, it's called The Great Entanglement. Oh, yes, I do have it handy. Let me just see what it's called. You can probably find it online as well. Okay. In Walsh, Maurice Walsh's translation, it's the supreme net, what the teaching is not. It's the Brahmajala Sutta. It's, in the, it's the first Sutta of the Digha Nikaya, which is the first book of the Sutta Pitaka. You can read that. Uh, to flesh out my statements, obviously I'm, only, I'm stating this is a whole sutta. I'm stating its conclusion in very uh, brief and bald terms. And if you like, you could also look at my talk at www.palisuttas.com, or you can go to the Dharma by the Tracks uh, Dharma Center and go to the bookcase and download the talk as well. And you can read uh, my discussion of this at greater length. And uh, see what, I, what, I, what I'm actually saying about this, what the Buddha is actually saying about this. Um, I see there's some internal conversation going on here, so I'm ignoring that. Rollo says, does attachment derive directly from the illusion of and focus on the self before including the desire to resist impermanence? Perhaps or perhaps a combination of these. Let me just read this question. Does desire derive directly from the illusion? All the, well, it, it resolves ultimately from ignorance. And then all the other things follow in a progressive series from ignorance. But uh, the, so self is an important part of that. But again, the delusion of a self arises from ignorance, and the belief in permanence also arises from ignorance. It all arises ultimately from ignorance, which is why wisdom is the primary salvific principle. If you look at the doctrine of the, 12, the twelve-fold chain of conditioned arising, you can see that very clearly. Ignorance is the primary principle. Okay, I don't see any other, any other questions, so let me just grab the dedication of merit. So if you have a burning question, type it now or forever hold your peace. We will meet at the Dharma by the Tracks Dharma Center uh, afterwards. If anyone's who's interested in having, we always meet after the talks to have an informal chat. So anyone who's interested in uh, meeting, us, going there and taking a look at our new Dharma Center, which uh, people seem to quite enjoy. It's in Maya. You can ask, TP, uh, ask me for a TP, or ask me for a landmark, or look it up in search. If you type Buddhism, you'll find it. Uh, or you can just go to Maya, and you'll probably find us, because it's Maya is pretty uninhabited, actually. Okay, so let's proceed with the dedication of merit. Whatever understanding, whatever positive force has come from this, may it go deeper and deeper and act as a cause to reach enlightenment for the benefit of all. Thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss Dharma. It is my pleasure and privilege. Until next uh, Tuesday at 4 p.m. Second Lifetime, Namaskar.